Welcome back to the channel. I want to talk about the latest GU abstract. This was out at the GU ASCO just last week. It's Keynote 564, Adjuvant Pembrolizumab in Kidney Cancer. But here's the most important thing. This is yet another example of oncology cheerleading, grossly unethical and uninformative studies. So I'm going to walk you through why this study is deeply uninformative. I'm going to walk you through the response that it got from the GU ASCO crowd. And I'm going to pose the biggest question, the question that we all face, which is why is oncology such a broken field, a field that many people don't want to do because they worry about this degree of corruption. So let's take a look. Keynote 564, adjuvant pembrolizumab, another unethical study, I call it. It is, it's terrible. So here's what people say about it, okay? This gentleman, the phase three keynote 564. This landmark study demonstrated a significant improvement in overall survival compared to placebo, making it the first to show such a meaningful survival benefit with adjuvant therapy and RCC. Yes, we finally did it. The first one to show a meaningful benefit, meaningful benefit in RCC. Bravo. Let's see if the study is actually done correctly. Okay, let's get to that. A lab from Harvard, the impressive practice changing findings from Keynote 564 presented by Dr. Chueri was a key highlight of ASCO. This is the first RCT to show a statistically significant OS improvement with adjuvant pembrolizumab for patients with renal cell carcinoma, 38%. Oh wow, the relative risk reduction, that's the great way to, to lie with statistics. Okay, great, all right, so there's a survival benefit. Rocket ship, rocket ship, star, star, clap, clap, clap. Look at all the emojis, ridiculous. This person writes, this is a famous person, this is the person who's behind one of the original prognostic indexes, indices in RCC. Keynote 564 is huge, sounds like Trump, 38% OS difference which solidifies Pembro's position in the adjuvant setting. In the, in the placebo group, 70% of patients had subsequent IO, which is good. Oh, is it good? And is it 70%? We'll come back to that. That's another way of lying with numbers because that's a very dishonest percentage there. The M0 subgroup is significant on its own. Yes, it also includes both adjuvant RCC and a few people who are fully resected metastatic disease. And that's what they think is the reason why it's positive, but we'll come back to that. Some more. No one sleepy this morning, thanks to Dr. Chueri in Keynote 564. Great to hear a round of applause this morning in Moscone. That's the center that was held. And by the way, People were still sleepy. I promise you, I promise you that these boring oncology results are not enough to wake anyone up. They're still sleepy, okay? Delivered boringly in a boring meeting, you're gonna be sleepy. All right, congrats to Dr. Chueri at GU24 presenting OS Advantage of Keynote 564. A historic moment. Oh, it's a historic moment now as he presents the first adjuvant trial to show an OS benefit with a hazard ratio 0.62, a 38% hazard ratio. The only thing they're not talking about is the actual absolute numbers and actually the crux of this trial, the big flaw in this study that makes it absolutely worthless, worthless when they ran it and they knew they were running a worthless study. We're going to get into that. They're not talking about that. A historic day. <laughs> it's more historic and great. And they always tag the PI. I mean, oncology is nothing more than empty flattering of the PI. I think they're all hoping that someday they might get a benefit down the road. I don't know. But it's just nothing but tweeting at the PI. Congratulations, congratulations. Tireless efforts on behalf of all our patients. Was it tireless? Didn't, didn't, got pretty tired when it came to post-protocol therapy, we're going to show. Got pretty tired real quick when it came to proper statistical design. Then you fatigued immediately. Okay. So here's the study design. They take these patients with patients with clear cell RCC, no prior systemic therapy. They generally had surgery and they were fully resected, either metastatic disease or M1 NED. Um, and, the M, and the M0 group was good performance status. Uh, Disease-free survival was a primary endpoint. Overall survival was a secondary endpoint. They're getting pembrolizumab or placebo for 17 cycles. And right off the bat, there's nothing wrong with this study design on this slide. There's no problem here. The question is, by giving everybody who's been resected, adjuvant pembrolizumab, do you improve overall survival versus just observing them, which is the standard of care at the time of the study? And I don't give anyone suitant, that would be crazy talk. This is the standard of care at the time of the study. But if you get assigned to placebo and you have progressive disease, you should get the standard of care available at the time of the study. The study enrolled from 2017 to 2019. In 2019, we knew, and all of these investigators changed their practice to pembroaxi. That was the publication of the pembroxitinib metastatic frontline study. So if you progress on placebo arm and you have metastatic disease, you should be getting pembrolizumab plus excitinib. That's what these investigators, this community of investigators would have, had, would have done for anybody outside of this study. So the question is, is giving everybody pembrolizumab upfront, knowing you're giving it to some people who may be cured already and they're getting it unnecessarily, 
Is that better than reserving it for everybody when they have progressive metastatic disease? That's the same question in Adora. It's the same question in many studies. And we have a paper forthcoming that's going to probe this question. And we've done a lot of work in this space. In fact, if I recall, it's my group that's actually put this on the map. It was also covered in malignant. Here's the overall survival results that they're celebrating. Look at that overall survival benefit. 38% reduction. You see it right there, the big 38%. There's the old saying in oncology, which is if you can fit the laser pointer between the curves, you can give the plenary session. And here you can fit probably two laser pointers. I don't think you fit three laser pointers. I think you'd slip away. There's a small, small sliver of OS benefit there. It's a sliver. I call it a sliver. I don't call it 38%. I call it a sliver. And I also ask if the control arm is getting the best available therapy outside of the study, or if they're perhaps getting an intentionally bad treatment so that it depresses that arm to create a spurious benefit when none exists. We're going to get into that. One person does ask, you know, there's always someone who still has their head on straight. Great work, Dr. Chueri. You didn't need to start with the great work because if it was great work, he would have had appropriate post-protocol therapy. Okay, it's shitty work. Okay, let's be honest. It's a shit. It's a shit. It's a shitty paper, and they didn't stand up and do what's right for patients, and they didn't have good post-protocol therapy. Okay, there's still an RFS benefit but only 48% of the people on placebo got salvage PD-1 therapy. For granularity, we need a kaplan meier forest plot of those treated appropriately at salvage for a fair eval. So he's onto it. He's not exactly right that even having a forest plot with subgroup analysis by people who got appropriate therapy or not appropriate therapy, that doesn't fully address the question and that could still lead to a false inference. However, having said that, at least he's thinking in the right direction. Salvage PD-1 is the question. And it is not 70% as Mr. Hang, as Dr. Hang thinks. It is 48%, 48%, which means only 50% of people on the placebo arm of this study, when they had metastatic disease, they got the appropriate standard of care. That means 50%, 52% didn't. Half of these people didn't. They got an inferior standard of care. They got a worse than what you would get outside the study. They're purposely, maybe not purposely, they're getting a, well, it's purposely, it's purposely to create a benefit when none exists. They are getting a flawed, inappropriate, delinquent standard of care that will depress their overall survival so that this trial can have a spurious overall survival benefit and not answer the relevant question. Let's take a look. This is the NCCN guidelines. Exitinib pembrolizumab was published in 2019 in the New England Journal, the year this trial stopped enrolling. The year this trial stopped enrolling, the vast majority of people had not had the event of interest because it takes years to have the events after they are fully resected on this study. They, all those people who progressed or relapsed after 2019 should have gotten exitinib pembrolizumab. What does exitinib pembrolizumab contain? A PD-1 antibody. Cabonivolumab, lenvantinib pembrolizumab, every category one recommendation, exitinib pembrolizumab, cabonivolumab, ipinevo, lenvantinib pembrolizumab, all the category one recommendations include a PD-1 antibody. It shouldn't be 48%. It should be 100% of people who have relapsed disease get a PD-1 antibody. That it's 40% represents the fact that you intentionally ran your trial in global settings where you knew post-protocol therapy was going to be delinquent. And that results in a delinquent and drop-down survival in the control arm. And you can create a spurious benefit from overloading people with pembrolizumab, half of whom don't ever need it, to create a spurious OS benefit and give the company billions of dollars. That's the entire design of this study. So no one deserves any congratulations for this. They deserve to be documented in the medical ethics books, because when history is written, this will be the new genre, unethical oncology trials of the 21st century. And we'll talk about polo. We'll talk about vision. We'll talk about this one. We'll talk about many, many studies. And the, the roadmap to that will be the malignant book, which has details all the sort of classic trial design flaws, subsequent therapies in the intention treat population. Here it is. They're saying among 210 people with placebo with documented relapse, they're saying 171 got any subsequent therapy. And among those who got any subsequent therapy, 145 got a systemic therapy and 101 out of 145 got a PD-1. So that's the 70% you see. But it's 101 out of 210 people. It's 48%. It's only 70% when you drop the denominator falsely, okay? This is such a misleading table. And here's another reason why it's misleading. It needs to tell you what they're getting line by line, front line, second line, third line. How many of these people got the PD-1 immediately upon progression? And how many got it as a second line drug? How many got it as a third line drug? When are they getting these drugs? Are they getting a combination of excitinib pembrolizumab? What are they getting? This table is woefully inadequate. If this paper is ever published in New England Journal or Lancet, they need to compel 
They need to compel the medical writer who's drafting it right now as we speak to put the information in a very granular way. 48% is shit. That means half of people on the control arm are getting a therapy that these investigators would not be giving in their office, a delinquent substandard therapy that's dropping the overall survival in the control arm, creating a spurious overall survival benefit. So we've done a lot of work in this space. This is a paper by Timothy Olivier and myself called Post-Progression Treatment in Cancer Randomized Trials, a cross-section of studies leading to FDA approval between 2018 and 2020. He's looking at all of the post-progression treatment and all of the studies. And the real question is this, when a new drug comes onto the market or you're trying to take a drug we already use and move it up front, you have to ask yourself, is the routine upfront use of this new drug or this drug we use later better than the best available current standard of care, which is giving it on the back end? If you don't give it on the back end, you're asking, is the new drug giving it early better than not getting it at all? But that's a question that doesn't apply to anybody on the planet because the countries that can't afford to give it on the back end, they sure as hell are not going to be affording, afford to give it on the front end. And the countries that can't afford to give it on the front end, like our country, the US, we're already giving it on the back end. So you're not asking a scientific question. You're not a scientist. You're just selling out these patients and the study so that the company can eke out another indication. You're part of the problem by doing this study. So we did another paper. This was Ashray Maniar. This was evaluating management of progressive disease for control arm patients in trials of PD-1 and PDL one inhibitor-based therapies for metastatic solid tumors. Here we're in the metastatic setting, but of course the logic of our argument will apply to the adjuvant setting. And very soon we're gonna come out with the adjuvant paper. That's coming shortly. The NCCN guidelines make it clear. Axi, Pembro, Cabo, Nevo, Lenvantan, and Pembro. All of these authors, all of these patients progressing should be getting a checkpoint inhibitor in the second, in, at the time of relapse, in the frontline setting as part of a doublet. And yet only 48% get it at any time in their subsequent care. And that is delinquent. That means the overall survival is not useful. Now this discussant showed this Kaplan-Meier figure of the RFS. Here's a problem I have with this figure. Where are the numbers at risk below the figure? You can't talk about cured from surgery or not cured or whatever until you show numbers at risk because there are tales and there are fairy tales. A tale is when you have more than 10% of people at risk and you see a real plateau in the survival curve. A fairy tale is less than 10% of people at risk and you see a continuing trickling of the survival curve. I suspect that this is a fairy tale, not a tale, but we will see. Now, there is a difference in the two curves and this person is arguing that 8% of people are cured by the pembrolizumab. Uh, that's a very bold claim that would say that you don't know what the word cure means, okay? Because one is based on the shape of that curve, it's very likely it's gonna keep dr trickling down in the future, they're gonna have relapse. Two is, to really say somebody's cured, you have to show that their survival function is equivalent to an age sex matched alternative after you've stopped therapy, and that takes a long time. So I wouldn't use the word cure. 40% progress despite checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Yeah, that's to be expected. But the real question is, if the surgery group was getting checkpoint inhibitors later, how many of them would have a durable remission as well? How many people are really alive with a durable remission 10 years later versus giving it to everybody up front or everyone on the back end? The other thing this shows you here is that 50% of the people on the placebo arm are not progressing even at a follow-up of like four years. That means half of the people getting pembrolizumab are getting it unnecessarily. Every, every thyroiditis, every immune-related adverse event, every colitis, half of people are gonna be experiencing those side effects for no reason at all. So this trial really needs a high bar before we give everybody adjuvant pembrolizumab, you need to prove it's better than giving it on the back end. I'm a little suspicious about that 210 number. This came out a few years ago in New England Journal. They already had 101, 151 recurrence or deaths. They say only 200 now. I wonder, I wonder what the actual number is. I'd like to see more data. This was a, this was a much more immature data. Finally, you know, the oncology community is just not critical. They're just patting themselves on the back. They finally got an overall survival benefit. And a lot of people are just saying, oh, this is my new algorithm. Everyone wants an algorithm in oncology. You know, I want a flow chart to tell me what to do. You know, it would be better if you actually read and thought about things and tried to come to your own conclusions and realize that, you know, you can't really trust ASCO or the journals or the manufacturer. They're all working for the same person, which is the manufacturer. The manufacturer is giving money to the journal for their reprints, the manufacturers giving money to the PIs, manufacturers giving money to the universities who run the study, the manufacturers designing and controlling the study, the manufacturer is giving money to ASCO to have their lavish boots. The manufacturer isn't, oh, no, they are giving money to the FDA. They're giving the user fee to the FDA, and then they're hiring all the FDA employees when the FDA leaves. The manufacturer is the one controlling this whole ecosystem, and the manufacturer wants you to give pembrolizumab in your breakfast cereal. But are you gonna be so stupid that you're gonna do what the manufacturer says, or are you gonna run a correct clinical trial? 
So don't tell me someone deserves congratulations or don't tell me they're courageous or work tirelessly when they're running shitty studies. And this is a shit study, absolutely shitty study. When you wrote the protocol, you should have said, when people on the control arm progress, we will pay for their Axie Pembro so that we will really be able to run an ethical study. And the same goes for the Adora investigators. They also didn't run an ethical study. This person wants to explain why all the other four studies are negative, and this is the positive study, and they look at the rate of stage of metastatic disease, that's NED, they look at the histology, they look at the PD-1, and blah, 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 blah. They have all these things on the slide. One thing they don't have on the slide is, what's the rate of post-progression appropriate treatment? That's not even on the slide. So it's not even in the brains of the people who are interpreting these studies, and that to me is a problem with this space. All right. What do I think? I think... Oncology is a deeply broken field. It is really the love of money that's driving this whole field. What's best for patients is so far on the back burner that people have forgotten it entirely. Everyone thinks they're a patient advocate. When you clap emojis for this, you're not a patient advocate. You're just part of the problem. And when the textbooks are written 100 years from now, 21st century oncology trials like Polo, like this one, they're going to look so unethical. There were many people at the time that these studies were conducted that told you that these are unethical studies. You cannot run giving everybody the drug versus running your trial in a place where people don't have access to the drug on the back end. That does not help people in low and middle income countries because they can't afford it on the back end. They sure as hell can't afford it on the front end. It doesn't help people in the US because they're not getting their question answered. Should I take this up front with all the attenuant risks or should I just wait to take it if I happen to progress and half of the time I won't? It doesn't answer anybody's question. You're really part of the problem. You need to stop, okay? And I know the consulting payments feel nice and traveling around and having everyone tell you how great you are feels great, but you have to use your brain. And if you don't want to use your brain, then why did you become a doctor? Why, why did you take that oath? You know, I really struggle. I don't understand why this field is so broken and unwilling to admit that this is a problematic study. It shouldn't change practice. I know it will. And the people who want to change practice are making a lot of money. The only people who don't want it to change practice are people who have an ounce of brain cells left, okay? So that's my thoughts. Terrible. GU ASCO, terrible. You know, people say this is the best thing at GU ASCO. I don't know what that means. If this is the best thing, then, you know, you guys aren't doing so well. All right. You like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. I'm happy to do videos on other topics. You can suggest that to me. You can follow me on Instagram. I'll put out some of these things on Instagram. You can follow me on Twitter. You can subscribe to Vinay Prasad's Observations and Thoughts. You can subscribe to Sensible Medicine. On Sensible Medicine, Tomorrow, I have a really interesting article about the two types of academics. The type of academic that says, here are some edits, it's okay, you don't need to include me on the paper, and the type of academic that says, can you tweet my paper? And those are the two academics that you need to know about. So, if you like this video, you know what to do. Send it to a friend, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and until next time.